Hello and welcome to Political Forum, Wednesday, July 19th. And today we welcome Senator Omar Aquino from the 2nd District. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you and me. my name is Freddy Calixto. I'm a board member here at Can TV. And this is a interactive program brought to you as a community service by Can TV. Be sure to tell your friends that they can also watch uh, this show online at cantv.org forward slash hotline. We welcome your calls, uh, if, your comments, and your questions for the Senator by calling us at 312-738-1060. We'll try to get as many calls in as possible with the, the time that's allotted. Uh, so if you have a comment or a question for the Senator, please call us at 312-738-1060. And welcome again, Senator. Uh, What's going on in the second district? We'll talk a little bit about those things. Uh, I have a few questions that I'm going to go through, sure. and we hopefully will have some calls that uh, callers would have uh, questions for your comments. Uh, let me start off with everybody's. Uh, what everybody's been talking about is this state budget that we uh, finally have. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are your reactions to it passing after Illinois has waited for over 700 days? I would say certainly there's there's relief. Uh, you know, uh, it's been over two years, almost two and a half years without a full budget, and uh, that's ha that's impacted not only the second district uh, but throughout the entire state of Illinois. We were uh, very getting very close to having the being the first state to have a junk bond status for our bonds. So um, our deficit had grown. Since since the point that we hadn't had a, a, a budget when Governor Rauner came into office to now from, I think, about $3 billion to a deficit now, 14 to close to $15 billion. Uh, so our deficit has imploded. Uh, and so we needed so, to take some action. Um, there has been some, a lot of negotiations, at least in the year that I've been in office, and, and it's taken us a long time to get to this point, and we couldn't uh, wait any longer. So I would say certainly there's a lot of relief. Uh, social service agencies now can can um, you know take a, a sigh of, of knowing that they're they're going to get some payments coming from the comptroller's office. Uh, students that rely heavily on MAC grants uh, to to go to uh, our universities in this in, in this state are, are now going to be know that they can return back to school hopefully. Um, you know, there's a lot of devastation because of a lack of a budget, but now there's uh, we're, we're trying to right the ship and getting some certainty back into the state. Um, there's, it's, it's, it's not, we're not done with the work that we have to do, but at least it, it gets us back into the uh, into, um, right direction. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, caller, we have a caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, State Senator Aquino, I want to know why, after 20 years, it took the African American and the Hispanics to get the majority in Alderman and, and things like that, and still nothing has changed. I'll give you an example, one quick one. There's at least $150 million with the construction going on downtown. Not one African American, not one Hispanic construction company is in on that. Oh, you see a few workers here and there, but I want to know why we elect our, our own people and still, and still we can't get in the gate of all the money that's downtown. Sure. Well, I call. I appreciate the question. Uh, you know, certainly we are trying to make sure that you know that that black and brown people and uh, uh, people from disadvantaged communities uh, certainly have more power uh, in, in in the political system, but throughout. And so there are um, sometimes contract requirements, especially with the city and state with public contracts that would require them to have minority contracts involved in uh, in, in many of those um, um, uh, things. And so. Um, I think that there, there, there's possibly, I believe that there has been some changes. Uh, certainly the work's not done. We need to continue to do so. Um, but to talk about a little bit of your first question sort of referenced of, of African Americans and, 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 and Latinos getting into power, specifically in, in politics, I would say 
right now we're, we, we are looking ahead to seeing how things are, how districts are remapped. Every 10 years after the census, there's a redistricting that, that's, uh, that gets done. Um, controversially, in the state of Illinois, it's done by legislators. And so sometimes uh, you hear the term of gerrymandering. So legislators creating districts that sort of benefit themselves politically to keep their power and so forth. And so um, when, I was, when I ran last year for, for state senate, I had talked about uh, certainly uh, being um, um, uh, in, in, in support of fair maps to make sure that we're doing it in a process that, um, that, is, that, that makes sure that people like yourself and our communities are represented by true representatives of, of our communities. At the end of the day, as a state senator, as a state rep, um, I like to say that um, I have many, many bosses. I have 220,000 people that live in the district. They're all my boss because I'm accountable to them. And so I, I ran on certain things that if I'm not doing a good enough job, then there's a re-election you know, every two to four years. And if I'm not doing a good enough job, then those in my community should, you know, certainly they get to hire and fire uh, their, their legislators. And so I think getting people involved and if you feel um, that those in, you know, that, that are representing you aren't doing their, their job, then certainly, you know, you have the ability to support and encourage others to, to vote um, and vote them in or out of office, and especially if they're not doing a good job out and if, if, if you're happy with their, their work, uh, to, to, to support them. Um, but again, in terms of what you're saying, in terms of making sure that, um, that minority contractors and, and workers and the labor force and so forth um, are, are getting uh, the reaping the benefits of a lot of the things that are happening downtown and, and throughout the state of Illinois. We have are putting in legislation, have put in legislation historically to make sure that minority contracting and a certain level of hiring is done uh, from, for uh, uh, minority workers. Uh, caller, thank you for that question and that comment. And Senator, thank you for that answer. Uh, so that's always a problem, you know, employment. Uh, at equitable employment throughout the state, especially when they're public projects. Mm -hmm. And I think you were correct in, you know, with the uh, requirements for the percentage. But I think what, what the caller is talking about is that there's never enough. No, you know, absolutely. Say, well, we need more. Yeah. I, I, I agree with the caller. I'm not saying that he's wrong. Absolutely, we need enough. But, you know, that it's a, it's a multifaceted issue, right? Um, it's also with education. We need to make sure that our communities are well educated so that those those skilled labor workforce that's needed that we're able to to have those uh, those um, uh, those those people there that have those skills that are needed. But also that if there's an entrepreneurial spirit in our communities and we have entrepreneurs that they're able to also bid for those uh, those projects and get uh, especially pro public projects. It's public dollars. We should be able to be able to uh, bid in a, in a fair uh, manner. Great. Uh, so talk, going back to the budget and, mm -hmm. the, and the budget being passed, sure. and you talked a little bit about that, but what does it mean for your district and what are your constituents telling you? Well, uh, what it means for my district, like I said, I, I've, I've gotten calls from, from, uh, from students, uh, MAC grant recipients that, that are related to know that they're going to be able to go back to school. I've gotten calls from social service uh, providers that had said, look, we've, we were concerned that we were going to have to lay off a significant amount of people. And right now, because of, of, of the stability that was brought by a budget, we don't have to take that drastic cut, which, which is ama amazing to hear. You know, when we talk about um, you know, uh, trying to make this state a, 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 a state for, for business and so forth and for workers and bringing more jobs, well, uh, not having a budget doesn't do that. Having a budget brings some credibility and stability to our state. Um, I've talked to public school uh, employees, teachers, uh, principals, and so forth that um, have a, are still concerned because there's a school funding formula that's still being um, uh, still has to be sent to the governor's desk. He's saying that he's going to veto it, but part all this is part of a, an ongoing conversation, especially with the budget, to make sure that. You know we're, we're we're funding our schools in an equitable way, and that there's going to be dollars there. So um, there's like I said, there's a sigh of relief not only as us from you know as legislators, but I think in our communities there's really this 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 thought that it's been too long. Um, we sh it's, it's embarrassing that we had to, that it's it's had taken so long for our state to finally get a full budget, but um, you know it's putting our state uh, in a better fiscal footing going forward. Great, thank you.
and we talked about the, the social service as well. Mm -hmm. that it, 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 you know, you've gotten calls from social service. Uh, in your opinion, is the state out of the woods, fiscally speaking? No, oh, absolutely not. No way. Uh, we have, like I said, a 14 to $15 billion deficit. And as while we still have that deficit, there's just no way that we can say that we're out of the woods. The other thing is that we still have a regressive form of taxation. You know, it wasn't easy nor did, did you know uh, to, to take a vote to raise uh, income taxes in the state of Illinois uh, to to 4.9 uh, 4.95 percent um, you know 1.2 uh, percent increase uh, especially when we're, we're when um, you know property taxes are so high everything the cost of living in the state and the city keeps on increasing um, and you know we need to get to a progressive form of taxation uh, that's why I'm a huge supporter of, of taking away a, a flat tax and getting you know uh, uh, getting a referendum on the ballot so that people can vote to say look we need a progressive form of taxation in this state and I'm hoping that in this upcoming session that we'll be able to do that because um, those you know it's just making our tax system more fair and equitable those that can't afford to pay more should be pay paying their fair share um, and and those that can't we shouldn't be putting the burden of our states uh, um, uh, fiscal um, um, problems onto them. So um, we're not out of the woods yet, but like I said, the, the budget uh, is, is at least getting us to a point that we're getting back to that. Um, hopefully what this budget didn't do, it didn't do a lot of terms of paying into um, the deficit. So it still continues to be there. There's going to be some other things in terms of uh, getting other bonds to try to pay down the budget, I mean the deficit and at a different rate. Um, but certainly we have a lot of work ahead of ourselves, but it's at finally getting a budget is finally getting us back to that, that, that stability in our state. Great. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, this is Senator Omar Aquino from the 2nd District. If you have any questions or comments for him, please call us at 312-738-1060 and, and ask your question or, or make your comment. Uh, some Illinoisans are upset but that we, you did pass a budget uh, with the state income tax increase. Mm -hmm. So it went from 3.75 to 4.95, as you just said. Uh, what, what, can, what else can you say to that? I know you just mentioned it, but. So I sit on the Appropriations Committee, both Appropriations Committee in the state, and so as that, I've spent six months in, in Springfield uh, asking the, the administration to find cuts that, that, that we, that, you know, ways to, to make our state more efficient and to figure out ways to, to, to um, for our budget to be, uh, you know, uh, lower. We, we have about an operating budget that varies from $35 million and up uh, sometimes. Um, and they, the, the, uh, the Ronald administration's own people couldn't really uh, provide us with much more than Medicaid cuts. So basically kicking people off of Medicaid that, that, that need those. And then we're talking about seniors, we're talking about low-income families, we're talking about people with disabilities. Essentially, the, 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 the thought was it's, uh, if, we can cut pe if we can take people off of, they wouldn't say throw people off of Medicaid, but essentially that's what the plan does, gives less people that ability to get health care. Um, you know, uh, we had to generate more revenue in order to pay for the budget that we have and to try to pay into a little bit of the debt that, that we have accumulated over the years. Again, we grew from three about a $3 billion deficit to uh, close to a 14 to $15 billion deficit uh, in, in about two and a half years, almost three years. Um, so the increase, you know, we, we in the state actually cannot increase property tax or anything like that, not that we wanted to, um, but that's a local thing. What we can control are income taxes. And unfortunately, like I said, um, when we raise income taxes based on our constitution, it's at the same level for everyone. It's at a flat rate. Um, we uh, in the state of Illinois had a 5% income tax that was being paid out just about three years ago. Um, that had sunset, so we're paying lower than that amount that was just implement that was in effect a few years back. Um, but I, I, I cannot implore more of the need for having a progressive income tax in our state of in the state of Illinois, where it's a tiered system, so those that cannot afford as much would have a lower uh, tax burden uh, tax rate, and it subsequently would go up based on the tier that you know the income that 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 person and their family uh, make. 
Um, there's several states around us, uh, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Kentucky, that all have a, a progressive system of a tiered system. I think it's a more equitable way of, of generating revenue and, and getting and, and taxing people. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that in this next uh, in this next session that that's the direction that will our state will be going in. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? Yeah, so with the, the budget passed, it seems now a lot of the focus is going towards the upcoming election. And in today's uh, news, they're talking about how I believe the governor and one of the uh, candidates going against them, they're spending about $120,000 a day on, the cam on their campaigns. Uh, that seems like a lot to me as a taxpayer. Uh, is there a way, is, is there anything to, to cap it? Or what, what's your take on that, Senator? Paul, oh, that's, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, there's way too much money in politics nowadays in the state of Illinois. Uh, our governor in December uh, wrote himself a contribution of a check for $50 million. And then uh, in the end of May, received from a friend of his, uh, another billionaire, gave him a $20 million contribution. So he has about $70 million in his pack. Uh, uh, and, and, and you're right, there was another... Um, uh, a Democratic candidate right now that wrote a significant uh, contribution to himself. Um, I think that we, you know, we are, I, I'm, and along with Senator, uh, uh, Senator uh, Daniel Biss, had pushed legislation to, um, to, to have an opt-in of uh, publicly financed uh, uh, elections. Uh, I th believe it would be a more fair, it makes it a, um, a more ability for having a grassroots type of uh, election. Um, I think we have to, um, this is an issue though that has to go at the federal level. You know, um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court had made a decision that determined that basically uh, contributions were free speech and that you have that ability. I think that we need to overturn that. Um, there's just too much uh, money, not only in local politics here in, in our state, but also nationally. And so I'm certainly in favor of, of finding caps uh, and setting uh, real cap limitations to, to contributions. And, and uh, even if they're uh, um, uh, self-funded, uh, there should be a, a, a certain amount. And also the idea of, 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 of publicly financed uh, um, is something that other states and other countries uh, do, and they do it well. And again, I think it makes it a way for, for true representation of people from the community that can get involved and try to make a difference and run. Caller, thank you for that question and thank you for that answer. That's uh, a lot of money that you're talking about there, so, wow. Uh, we have another caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? Hi, hi. Thank you very much for taking my call. I wanted to ask the Senator about some news coverage I saw the other day that says, despite the fact that lawmakers finally passed a, a budget in Illinois, there's still a chance that schools, public schools all over the state may not open on time because of an appropriations clause in the budget. I'm talking, I guess, about um, changing the funding formula. Now, I know you talked about um, Governor Rauner's um, likely stance that he would, you know, veto mm -hmm. um, that. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about the impact it would have sort of throughout the state. Absolutely. If that, you know, is not, in fact, passed? Absolutely. No, caller, thank you so much for that, that question. That's a great question. So um, what the caller is referring to, so there's a Senate bill number one, um, which is a school funding formula to change the formula of how we um, uh, fund our public education system in the state of Illinois. Um, there, uh, we had passed both in the, the Senate and the House um, this bill, it's, on, it, it, it's not on the governor's desk yet. Um, it will be going uh, soon, but the governor has already stated that he plans on, on doing an amendatory veto, basically vetoing, vetoing a portion of, of the bill. Uh, the portions that he uh, appears that he will be um, vetoing are things that impact especially uh, the city of Chicago. Um, he is, unfortunately, has paid politics in, in, in regard to this state and, and in regards to the city. Um, he terms um, uh, uh, money that would be going to the city of Chicago as a bailout. 
Um, it's not actually accurate. What happens is that in Senate Bill 1, there's a hold harmless provision also within the bill. So uh, no, no uh, school district within the, uh, within the state would actually be losing money. So each will be gaining some money within this new formula. Uh, they, what, what also is included is that no school districts will be losing any money from previously that they previously had. So going forward, uh, the formula would take, would take place. Uh, this was something that was negotiated from both sides of, uh, from you know, Republicans and, uh, and Democrats. This is also something that has been worked on for years uh, in our state uh, with, with um, um, educational professionals and so forth. And so Senate Bill 1 was something that, I, again, had, had came to a consensus and it had a, a great amount of support. Uh, um, uh, but unfortunately, it seems like now the governor is, is, is threatening to veto it, at, even at, through an mandatory veto. Um, uh, at, the end, at the end of the day, the essence of this legislation is to correct a wrong. The way that we uh, fund school districts is inequitable. Um, the, the poor school districts in our state um, do not, at the end of the day, uh, have the ability to have as much um, uh, to provide uh, a quality education to their students. The reason is, is how we fund it. Uh, it's heavily based on property taxes. Uh, we don't, uh, from a state, provide 100% of the school funding. And so in order to, to meet that need, that, 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 that um, uh, that gap that is that is uh, the school districts that from the money that we don't get from the state, um, they raise their property tax. Uh, but if you have different areas that have you know higher property tax values, have the ability to pay more, well certainly they're gonna they're gonna do a lot better than poorer school districts. And so that's why you see a lot of uh, inequity inequity in our um, uh, not only in the school funding formula but in the outcomes of our education, unfortunately. And so this has been an, an issue that has been uh, been tried at. Um, this specific bill, though, has been something that came out of um, a commission. It has uh, been uh, negotiated on many sides and with many professionals. And so I'm hoping that, you know, once we send it to the governor, that he'll rethink and actually um, sign this bill and make it into law. Uh, if not, unfortunately, then, I, then I, I do hope that, you know, we'll have enough support to, to override the veto because this is a, it's a, beneficial, it's a beneficial bill. It's certainly not a bailout. Um, the city of Chicago actually, out of the many school districts that we have, I think is ranked, and I have it somewhere in my paperwork, um, it's set to make about 200, the 263rd out of many uh, school, 260, excuse me, other school districts will get more funding per pupil than sh the city of Chicago. So this is in no way to say that the city of Chicago, this is a city of Chicago bill, not at all. You know, this bill is actually, um, the chief sponsor is Andy Menar. He's a Southern um, uh, legislator. And so this was a bill to, to, to make sure that we're just righting a wrong that for many years we have an inequitable uh, school funding formula. Thank you, caller, for that question. Uh, again, call, caller, uh, call us at 312-738-1060 for any calls for the alderman. Or any questions, I'm sorry. We have a caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? We can't hear him. Caller, we cannot hear you. Caller, okay, we can't hear the caller. Sorry, you might try calling again, okay? Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, ask you about the a bill, House bill that was introduced, mm -hmm. uh, House Bill 2426, uh, which would mandate that at least 25% of any new funding that is over or above the previous year's fiscal allocation for preschool education, parental training, or prevention initiative programs will go to a newborn or to three-year-old children in Chicago public schools. How does the budget pass, passing it affect it? So, um, so it was a law that clarifies to dedicate more resources to infant and, and, and toddler education programs. Essentially, the earlier we can get you know kids into into educational environment, uh, the better outcomes we have seen. I mean, this is statistically proven. Um, but this was a bill of, uh, that was started out from the Alto Prevention and the Sergeant Shriver uh, Center and, 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 and many others. Um, the, house, the House bill sponsor was uh, Barbara Flynn Curry. I was the Senate uh, 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 chief sponsor of the bill. And... Um, I, the bill, from my understanding, uh, 
that was a provision that in case we didn't actually have a full budget in place that we would have money that would be dedicated to to ensure that you know preschool education and, and infant and for infant and toddlers were, were there uh, despite um, what the fiscal issues would have been in the state uh, but now with an actual budget um, the the um, um, that should be rectified with within itself they should have enough of the resources hopefully now uh, for for those types of programs great thank you uh, do we have a caller on the line caller hello do we have a caller caller are you there no we don't have we can't okay uh, well uh, we're about running out of time. I have one last question before we wrap this up. Sure. Uh, and I think we talked about this, or not, uh, kind of uh, alluded to it. Mm -hmm. Elected CPS school board. The Senate approved a measure. Where does it stand now? So uh, the Senate approved a measure, but with a uh, there was a um, amendment um, that was put onto it uh, that would include of how it was uh, the the maps were going to be designed. So that there was a change made. Um, it was sent back to the House. The House uh, essentially has to take it up for in concurrence and, and essentially vote on it again. It originated out of the House. Uh, and so now with the amendment, the, 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 the House would have to take it back up and, and vote on it so that it can be sent to the, uh, uh, to the governor's desk. Um, I'm hoping that, that this bill would be called. Um, you know, this has been many, many years since 1995 when they, when they made the, the change for Chicago uh, elected school board to go into an appointed school board. I think there's been a there's been an initiative since then to go back to an elected school board. Um, I'm in total support of it. I was uh, uh, the chief sponsor of it in the in this or one of the uh, co-chief sponsor, excuse me, in in the Senate. Um, it's I think it's, it's certainly needed when again when our, uh, uh, most of our property taxes or a good portion of it goes to our public school system we are all invested into the public school system so we should have a system where we get to elect um, our rep you know to select our representation on the school board that are making decisions on the public schools be it if you send your child uh, to your public school in, in your area or not um, as a as a taxpayer you have um, uh, some skin in the game uh, a good portion of your uh, the, the property taxes go to the, the local school uh, school district so i think that we should you know it's only fair to have a democratic way of electing uh your representatives that make decision on, on on your public dollars great great thank you for that answer uh this is about it we're running out of time we ran out of time here so i'd like to thank sylvia our technician thank you very much for taking the thank calls you, uh thank you for being on the show uh until the next time Oh, we didn't even get to uh, show your your uh, uh, yeah. your overhead. <laughs> Let's show that on the way out. And the uh, um, the flyers. Yeah. Can we do that? We got time for that, so yeah, we're still on. Okay. You want to talk really quick? About yeah. That? So we have a a a um, family health fair that's going to be at Mozart Park on Friday, August eighteenth. It says the twenty first annual. Uh, because this is actually an initiative of the Northwest Side Health Advisory Committee. This was um, started by uh, Senator uh, uh, Miguel Del Valle and continued by my predecessor, Senator William uh, Delgado. And so I, as a senator in the 2nd District, am uh, trying to revive this health fair that unfortunately in the last few years has uh, hadn't uh, hadn't uh, uh, been continued. And so we're trying to bring it back. And so with the help of a lot of, of, of of community partners, we're going to have this health fair. So it's it's Friday, August 18th, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Mozart Park at 2036 North Avers Avenue, which is Avers and Armitage. So all are welcome. Everything is free. Families and and that come um, are, are going to be able to get vaccinations for their for their kids. It's a it's a family health fair. So it's not just back to school. It's not just for the kids. It's for the, for the entire family. So there's a there's a senior uh, portion of it as well. So you can play bingo, get health checks and, and so forth. So I'm um, hoping everybody can come out. And if you live in the second district or, or not, we, we're, we're not going to kick anyone away. So please do come by. All right. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.